are locating the bridge and I always like to wait until actually I have to wait until I have the frets installed in order to install the bridge we could locate it before then but we couldn't install it mm -hmm. and that's because in the end the height of our bridge is going to be based off of the height of our fret tops okay which that always leads to the bridge being basically of a certain height mm -hmm. but just in case there's slight variability between your neck angle or between the height of your fret tops uh, it's good to leave your bridge just a little bit extra tall so we can shave a tiny bit off the top in order to meet that ideal height every time. Locating the bridge, there's two different ways that we can do that here, or at least I have two different tools for this. I like to use this um, Stumac, I always get this wrong, it's either the, inton no, it's not the intonator, it's the Saddlematic. This tool is called the Saddlematic. You absolutely do not need this tool. Um, I have it because I used to do a lot of repairs and setups, and when you're dealing with multiple scale lengths, it's a nice convenient thing to use and to have, as you'll see, but you can honestly do this with just a ruler if you know your scale length, right? So, uh, in fact, I used to use this ruler right here, and that's why you see this little piece of blue tape, just because when you do something repeatedly, it makes sense to put a little piece of tape on there with two marks for your saddle location. I see. Okay, so that way I can just bring this in and slide the, the bridge to its appropriate location underneath the saddle, right? I have two marks there, by the way, as you'll see with this tool as well, because there's a treble position for the saddle and a base position. Mm -hmm. uh, as you may have noticed, on any steel string acoustic flat top guitar that the saddle is slanted, mm -hmm. right? You've right. probably seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a classical guitar, it's straight. Hmm. The reason it's slanted is because of the steel strings require greater added compensation. It's just a material difference that the windings on the strings <coughs> in particular, along with the steel cores, have greater need for added compensation than nylon strings, which don't have those added windings. So nylon string, uh, a classical guitar needs very little compensation, and um, a steel string guitar needs more compensation on the bass strings than on the thin, unwound, plain steel treble strings, okay? So the windings are kind of the, the key difference there and the reason we have that slanted saddle on uh, flat top acoustic guitars. So now this thing right here, the way this works, the saddlematic, is you butt this up against the nut like that, okay? This front edge, and you can just ignore these little pincers for now, I'll explain that in, the section, in a second. That's actually your compensation that I was talking about. You butt this up against the nut. We haven't made the nut yet, mm -hmm. so it's just an empty so just slot. Feeling flush. Exactly, I'm just gonna feel that flush and then this you set that up for the 12th fret and there's a little groove under this block so that it'll rest right on a fret okay so there we go so the distance from the leading edge of the nut to the 12th fret is exactly half of our nominal scale length Okay, what I mean by nominal scale length, and that part's important, is that's the scale length in name, okay? Mm -hmm. So, 25.34 inch scale length is what we have here. That means that mathematically, it, the spacing of these frets it, uh, is based off of 25.34 inches in total. But, in actual length, it's gonna be slightly longer because of that added compensation and I guess at this point I'll explain a little bit about what compensation is Are you you guys familiar at all with that term vaguely vaguely yeah most people like they kind of heard of it but there's nothing don't really nothing get to do it with intonation or does it um, it does, it does okay. no it does because <clears throat> if, if you don't add the compensation your intonation will be off and particularly the further you play up the fretboard it'll be off by more okay. 
the out of tuneness, the inherent out of tuneness of a fretted instrument, ideally is distributed evenly throughout the various keys so that you don't hear it. You don't notice that it's not perfect like a piano, you know? Mm -hmm. So, what compensation is, what it's compensating for, is the fact that in order to play a fretted instrument, you have to depress the string down to the surface of the fret. And that action of pressing the string down, it actually, one, it stretches the string, and if you stretch it, you add tension, which sharp, makes it go sharp, right? Mm -hmm. Sharpens the pitch. So, lengthening of the scale length is a flattening effect. Mm -hmm. So we're countering that by adding a tiny bit of lengthening there, okay? And it's what kind of like I was alluding to just mm -hmm. a moment ago, it's never perfect. That's not the idea. It's not, um, it, it's more about uh, spreading out the error so you don't notice it. Hmm. The, the idea is you can build a guitar that will sound absolutely perfect or I guess virtually perfect in say the key of E, mm -hmm. but then it's gonna sound noticeably bad in other keys. Hmm. And most people don't want an instrument like that. Right. Uh, they would rather mm -hmm. have one that yeah, it isn't perfect, but you can't tell in any key because it's evenly distributed amongst them. Cool. So that's equal temperament. That's um, what intonation is all about. And that is the reason why we add compensation. Okay. All right, so back to this. We have the front edge of this tool right here to this little box here with the groove. Mm -hmm. That is half of our scale length to the 12th fret, our octave. If we then flip this around and place it back on the octave, that gives us our full scale length. I'm just gonna give him one second here. That's fine. Um, we flip it around, place it back on the 12th fret, so obviously we've doubled uh, that distance now, right? And that gives us our full scale length. And then these little pincers here represent the compensation, mm -hmm. which you can basically set these. Um, the difference between the compensation for a 25.34 inch scale length, a long scale, and some other common scale length, like a 24.9 inch or something, the difference in compensation, technically there's a difference, but it's so small that um, you can almost just set up these pincers for life, right? And just use it for various scale lengths. That's, so that's what like I found. a millimeter or two difference? Like you were saying between yeah, the bass yeah. and the treble? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I forget exactly what this is set up as, but um, mm -hmm. there's a comp, if you go online, compensation calculator, you'll okay. find something probably from, I think Stu Mac has a good one. And so, yeah, we won't get into exactly how to calculate the, the amount, but as you can see, it's like, it's usually within an eighth of an inch. It's a pretty small amount yep. mm -hmm. and more like a 16th or less on the treble side. Okay, so I've got this resting there. And now to locate our bridge, what we want to do is we want to be located on the center line, which we can still see a little bit. We might want to darken that up just to make this easier. It, it needs to be located on the center line. Oh, that's windy. And beneath our saddle. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and line this up. And we have a center line on the side Mm -hmm. on each side right there. If you could grab me a pencil, please. Uh, not that one, though. Thank you. So we're going to take this, and I'm going to place it just like I said. I want the, the saddle to be in the center of that space. By the way, in, in the online course, I give you, I, off the top of my head, I actually don't even remember what they are because I just place it, I just 
place it in the center. But I do give you sort of minimal dimensions for don't be this close to the front edge, okay. don't be this close to the bridge pins. So you can find those minimum dimensions there. And so that looks good right there. Now to your eye, you might be looking at this and thinking, ah, that looks like it's way too close to the front. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look centered. Um, but the thing is, these pincers actually represent the leading edge, the front edge of the saddle, not the center of the saddle. Okay. And so knowing that this is an eighth of an inch wide saddle, that's where I'm going to position it and that looks roughly centered right there. Okay. All right. And so that looks good. So now I'm actually going to just put this to the side and hold this here. Turn my attention to the center line. And I'm lining that up on center. There we go. And then here, why don't you do me a favor and just put your finger right there. So now we're lined up on center and I'm going to bring this back and uh, just double check that I didn't move off my mark and that I don't want to now adjust this way. So it's kind of like a back and forth mm -hmm. in that way, but actually that looks perfect. So we're aligned under the saddle and on our center line. Go ahead and hold it at the wings now, like that. It's just a more stable way of holding that. And before I clamp this in place and drill through the E-string holes to set our location, I'm gonna just gently trace it just so that if it shifts slightly in this process, which it shouldn't, but if it does, I'll know it because I'll see that it's now off its marks. So go ahead and keep holding that. So if you didn't have a helper, would you uh, put tape on there or just make No, sure? it's it's not too hard to hold it. Okay. So yeah, when I don't have a helper, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm just holding it. Um, yeah, I, just, I, just making sure you don't. I would have this more by my side and kind mm -hmm. of ready to go. Okay. Um, but it's not too hard to, to do this by yourself. But hey, well, I got helpers, I'm going to use them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a cam clamp with a little call that uh, I've taped on here. And that's simply because the, uh, the X-Brace is in our way a little bit. Oh, I see. So I like to use this to sneak past the X-Brace and this call will rest right on the bridge plate. Okay? And this is just to hold it in place. Wow. We drill through the E-string holes. And then our position will be set once we drill through those holes. So just a little detail here, this camp clamp has to be perfectly centered. Um, otherwise the chuck of the drill, at least the one that I have, will kind of get in the way and bump into the clamp. Okay, so you can let go. And I'm going to get the drill. All right, what do you guys think so far? Do you have any... Oh, that's what was Hitachi. Hitachi became Makita, is that true? Or am I completely wrong? I'm not even familiar with Hitachi, so that could be the case. <laughs> yeah, I've never even seen a green one like that. I've seen it in your videos, and I'm like, oh, that's Well, cool. Makita is, is black and green as well. No, oh, it's, it's a bluish. It's bluish. <laughs> Blue green. All right. You might be right. You're probably right. I'm thinking of a different company. Okay, so actually this is my old drill. I switched to battery powered for, yeah, for everything else that. as you saw. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny because remember back there was, a, there was a time period where batteries just sucked mm -hmm. for power tools. They were, they would, the yes. tool would be like toast in the, within a year yeah. or something like that. Much better. So I actually made sure I had corded everything. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I realized like, oh wow, technology is way better now I should have batteries so I still have this though and I only use it for this job because it has a nice narrow chuck mm -hmm. just so happens that my battery powered ones have this big stout yeah. chuck and it gets in the way I can't really get in there you had a really long bit or something right right to be yeah, way up right. here you could, mm -hmm. that would work as well okay so we've got a 316 of an inch hole 
That's our bridge pin holes. So I'm going to use a 3 16 of an inch bit here. And just like we've seen before, there's nothing backing us up. There's no block, scrap block down there to prevent tear out. So, which there are ways to get a scrap block down there like this if you were worried about it at home. But you can also just go high speed, low pressure. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna let the weight of the drill carry this through. And that way I won't get tear out. Now, because we're only clamped, I just wanna point this out. We're only clamped along the center here. We, we don't have, ideally we would have two clamps holding this down so it can't, right, exactly, it can't rotate off of position. Um, but as long as you're careful, it won't. But that is why I have that pencil line there, so at least I'll see if it does rotate, rotate off of position. If you hold the drill loosely, it'll center itself. And there it is. Bring that back up. Hold the drill loosely. Okay, you can see our pencil line, nothing moved as, as expected. All right, comes off. Okay, so you guys know what I mean by holding it loosely, it'll center itself. See, when I was yeah. doing that, um, you may have noticed It'll actually like kick a little bit this way because I'm not like really resisting it. But by doing that, it allows this, if I'm holding it like this at an angle, it'll pull itself straight mm -hmm. within you're not, reason. You're not pinning it against the side. Ex like. Exactly. I'm not forcing it into a, a position it doesn't want to be in. Okay. So now what we're going to do is, well, one thing we're going to do is rest a straight edge on here and see where that straight edge meets the bridge so that we can level this if we need to level it at all. And uh, then we're gonna clean this up. We don't even need these pencil lines anymore. Mm -hmm. All we need are these two holes mm -hmm. to hold our position as we glue the bridge. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the camera off now and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do all that stuff. All right, bye-bye. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.